I think this section is going to be kind of fun because if you guys are familiar with our work, you know, we wrote the Neanderthal No More series about three years ago. Five part series that took us forever. You know, a lot of email revisions back and forth and lots of incest jokes and whatever else <laughs> Eric says about <laughs> Indianapolis and Fort Wayne. So <laughs> after I took that berating, you know, we came up with this program and, you know, when we wrote it, we we're like, this is pretty damn good. You know, we thought we were pretty cool. But, you know, three years later, we've had time to, you know, look over it and try and get an idea of, you know, what went right and maybe what we would change now. You know, not that it's necessarily bad, but how can we make this program better? And so we thought it would be really cool to have you guys critique our program. All right? So we've got the whole program laid out here. And we're going to go through it day by day. And you guys should have a copy there. So what we're going to do is just kind of go through and look at the separate days. And hopefully you guys can give us some feedback. You know, what exercises would you change? How would you make it better? Okay? And so hopefully you guys are going to be able to actively get an idea of, you know, this is what they were thinking, but we could do this better now, knowing what we know from the last two days. So let's go ahead and get into it. All right, day one. Let's take a look. We'll go through one by one. Supine bridge is something we walked through with Tony a little bit earlier. Just a dynamic flexibility activation movement. Um, again, I can't really see anything wrong with that. It's something we still use to this day. Anybody have anything they want to bring up in relation to anything? We'll go right through. Would you work it on a ball to get a little bit more, um, to work some of the instability factors? Well, again, um, it, it's not so much a, we're not trying to train instability or anything like that. We're just trying to train activation. So it's, it's more something that's geared towards, all right, let's get those glutes firing. Let's get our button gear. Okay. Sure, what's up? I guess you could throw a mini band around. Exactly. Yep. So some, some abductor activation never hurts. We do that as well, too. So that's a, that's a great point. So again, when we initially wrote this, we didn't have our DVD out. We really hadn't delved into dynamic flexibility. Nobody really had at that point. It was, it was still something that was really, they were kind of cracking the surface on of it. So, um, you know, as years have gone on, people have gotten a little bit more um, appreciative of, of how much of a difference like a, a true mobility slash activation warm-up can be. And this was kind of just something that was haphazardly thrown in after like a, a classic warm-up scheme, unfortunately. So, so this is more of a, a hip-dominant dance. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Yep, as a whole it is. And which, the, in, and in fact, the whole program really is. <laughs> if you really think about what people mostly need. So, but going through, uh, let's talk about this entire first day. What issues do you guys potentially see, stuff that we might be doing a little bit differently right now in light of some of the stuff we've talked about this weekend? Throw some ideas around. So you, you, with your warm up with rolling. Exactly, yeah, so again. Much the, the better warm up. I mean, that was pretty, when you yeah. just do two things to warm up, you know, there's a lot more to a warm up than just, I mean, obviously we want to groove the right movement pattern to get the right muscles working, but there's something to be said for just raising core temperature, you know, improving the active flexibility. What's the goal of the program? Again, the whole goal of the program was postural correction. I didn't, I'm sorry. That's all right. Five articles. Okay. <laughs> no, that's fine. Actually, that's fine. they were Caressi and Robertson on the, those oh. articles. Just, no, I'm kidding. Well, I'm not, <laughs> not, not, not preference. Keep telling yourself that. Guest <laughs> <laughs> stars. <laughs> Uh, long stride, reach up overhead. So just like the hip flexor stretches we did with Tony a little bit earlier, just with the overhead reach to increase the, the actual stretch itself. So again, that's something, that's something I would tinker with too much. Sure. First thing you get rid of the, high, the side hip thrust, just because you see we focus more on stability as opposed to the There you go. Exactly. So again, that's more of a QL exercise that trains a little bit more dynamically. Okay. So we're changing, um, going into like actual like a lateral flexion type thing and coming back up. Again, I'm not doing nearly as much side bending stuff. Again, we're, we're training to promote ro rotation. So we'd probably go ahead and throw in something like a side bridge here instead. Sure. I'd probably get rid of the dead bug. Yeah. I, you know, that dead bug was never really my cup of tea. I know that was always something dead, dead bug Mike The biggest thing about the dead bug is it's got to be coached properly and you got to have a pretty good client to teach them the, the right movement pattern because if they don't know how to do it or you don't know how to coach it, it's not going to be effective. They're going to get movement at all the wrong places and you're just going to reinforce all the movements that we're trying to correct. So, it's the know. interesting thing about collaborative efforts. Dead bugs were never really my cup of tea, but Mike had done a, a lot of work with um, you know, some different stuff. That, he's a dead bug guy. Yeah. He's, he's been called worse. So. <laughs> 
the second station, B1, B2, mm -hmm. snatch grip, deadlifts, and IT band stretching. Mm -hmm. Are you just doing that to facilitate each set? Like, in other words, are you doing just B1, A2? Yeah, again, it's a little bit of something we know people need to be getting stretched out in between sets, so might as well do it while they're, uh, you know, while they're resting anyway. So it's not so much a matter of the stretch being important at that specific moment in time. It's just a matter of, so hey, so they're standing around, let's give them something to do. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, but it's in the stature of deadlifts, um, I'd still keep those in there. Again, it's a great movement for teaching lifting posture, um, you know, and, and really forces people to keep, stay nice and upright. So one of our big emphasis was that is that they need to be very strict. I mean, you can pull snatch grip deadlifts with a very kyphotic posture and everything, but in, in this case, we really wanted people to stay nice and upright. So I mean, that, that's really all we, we were looking at for day two. But I think really these are your, uh, these are your babies down here, and, and also looking back, I probably would have done like a dumbbell step up first again bringing that uh, resistance up, changing the center of gravity early on in someone who might not have the best frontal plane stability right off the bat. It's probably too quick of a progression and we want to back it down just a little also, bit. It's very sagittal plane dominant. That's exactly what I was going to say. There's yeah. not a lot of transverse and frontal Maybe plane stuff yeah, in there. Yeah, the step up, you can do a lateral lunge. That's a, that's a big misnomer actually because people don't understand um, single leg stuff appropriately. When you're, when you're doing a single leg exercise, you're not just training the sagittal plane. You're in the sagittal plane. But what's very important to consider is that you're stabilizing in both the frontal and the transverse plane. And the main problem in, in our industry is we get co so caught up in the functional training craze. We say we got to put people multi-planar and blah, blah, blah. People shouldn't be in other planes if they haven't mastered the sagittal plane. Yeah, you know, that's, a, that's a big issue. I mean, we talked about doing things correctly before we do things differently. And people have no place doing lateral lunges if they can't do a, f a straight on lunge. So again, you know, I, I think from a you know, purely movement standpoint, I think that's something that would have been attended to well in the mobility warm up and stuff. But yeah, sure. Every exercise. Yeah. Every exercise is three planes. Yeah. You're resisting motion right. all planes. It doesn't matter whether it's sagittal plane and movement exercise, they're still resisting motion frontal and transverse. It's frontal plane exercise dominant. You're still resisting the motion in the other planes. It doesn't matter. So it, it might not have to be a dynamic movement in the frontal plane. It could be a lateral, like lateral um, stationary uh, sort of lateral split squat. So you like that Yeah. Right. It doesn't matter. It still takes you and moves, puts you into a different plane of movement uh, bias. Again. Whereas that's very. And again, that's something I, uh, like, like we said, I think that if had there been a more comprehensive warm-up, that's the place to address it. I'm, I mean, I'm a firm believer in using my resistance training session to apply resistance, and you're not going to be able to load people really, really well in, in different planes, unfortunately, but you do make a great point. People just need to get out of their comfort zone sometimes, and you know, from a pure mobility standpoint, the more we can you know, get them into different ranges of motion, just in our warm-up especially, I think that's going to make a big difference. But um, I mean, the big thing with the, with the sagittal plane stuff, you know, single leg uh, exercises again. Remember that it's it's also a big challenge in the frontal and the transverse plane, even if you're not necessarily moving in that. So, you know, even more so than what you're going to get with like a squat or a deadlift. But that's, well, a, that's an excellent point. And the bottom line is, I think you're already seeing the uh, downfall of the cookie cutter program, because I mean, if we look at the difference between a 20 year old athlete that's got bad posture and 80 year old woman that's got bad posture, it's going to be totally different with regards to our exercise selection, loading, and all those things. So. You know, so we always have to uh, individualize and make it as customized as possible. Yeah, this is pretty much the last cookie cutter program I think I wrote. I don't know about Mike. Not, right. There's not much I'm more to it, so moving on. Day two. What are we looking at here? Anybody who can uh, throw some ideas our way? Pick out whatever you can think. Sure. Go ahead, Mike. I like how he's thinking, man. That's good. Yeah. A couple weeks ago in Syracuse too. He's a good. Ah, yeah, okay. Mike, so he's Mike knows his stuff. Um, tr truthfully, I probably wouldn't even put wood chops in here okay. because chances are a lot of these people are going to be so messed up that they're not going to be ready to train rotation anyway. So I would hammer on a lot more stability. We've been doing a lot of side bridges, um, maybe even some like suitcase deadlift to keep it purely like um, more of like a, a linear movement rather than you know or sagittal plane. I guess is a better way to describe it, but. Um, you know, the thing that jumps out of me, just going in order, uh, pronated medium grip row. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with, like, if you get people who have shoulder problems, when you're first bringing them back into a rehab scenario, they're going to have the most trouble doing rows with a, with a pronated grip because it's going to get really, really internally rotated and it's going to shut down the, the submicrobial space. So if you look at rehab protocols, typically they'll start with a neutral grip. In some cases, they'll actually have to go into, like, a supinated grip to really open things up. So for us to throw this in in kind of the first phase might not have been the best idea. It probably would have been better for us to to kick it back into a phase two after they had done a month or so at, at, at a neutral grip. And again, this 
you know, if, if we're talking with purely healthy individuals, it's great because again, you go into a pronated grip, you're internally rotated, so you're facilitating the external rotators. So from a postural correction standpoint, it's great. But when you consider that some of these people might have had some residual shoulder problems, it might not have been the best thing to, you know, kind of throw them into. Would you, would you consider doing it like uh, with dumbbells bent over with start pronating and finish? It's not a great way to do it. Exactly. So uh, the only thing that's a little bit trickier is, uh, you know, there's a little bit more of a tendency to cheat in beginners with the dumbbell rows. So, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge seated row guy. I mean, I won't, I won't lie about it. And some people will call it kind of a namby pamby exercise, but it just, it fixes things. Yeah. You know, it just, it works out really nicely. Um, but again, in addition to what Michael talked about, we also looked a lot at just doing things correctly instead of differently. We know how many people can really um, screw up face pulls. And, and honestly, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of, of any kind of real like extension work. It just tends to beat up on a lot of people's elbows. And the reason we threw it in here is because we didn't want to do a lot of pressing at the shoulder girdle. And this was before Mike and I really knew a lot about using like eccentric quasi isometrics. So like Mike said, um, throw in some, um, some kind of like a push up iso hold instead of that. So again, let's still train them at the shoulder girdle, but let's make it productive instead of uh, stuff that's actually going to contribute to the problem. You're not actually going into a full dip. You just, no. just work in the serratus and all that. Just yeah, it's, it's still on my key now. Just because of the, you know, the fact that it's behind you. Um, you can do them on a regular dip stand, but um, you know, as a whole, a lot of beginners just don't have the motor control to keep that scapula tucked tight to the rib cage. So it might be too advanced an exercise for them. So I do like more of a scap push up, like a, a supine dumbbell protraction, something a little bit more isolated. Because that's, again, that's more of an integrated movement pattern. What's the B2? Uh, B2, decline barbell extension. So, so like so on a decline bench? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, and I think the biggest thing when we look at this page, you know, we went through a lot of these exercises today. So it's what Eric talked about earlier. It's not necessarily doing different things. It's doing things right. And, you know, there's some complex exercises here. How many people are going to be able to perform them the way we want them to be performed? It's all about proper execution. And just most people aren't going to be able to do a lot of these right. That's why writing programs on the internet is tough. Matt, what's up? Uh, I'm sorry, no, the, the, yeah, this, is, this is just the actual training sessions themselves. Yeah, I might use them in subsequent phases more than I would in kind of the first phase, but you know, again, I think, it, I think we just missed the boat on rotation for a long time. There were so many people saying, yeah, I, you know, it's functional to performance. We've got to train rotation hard. And you know, a couple of years later, here we are sitting with a lot of people with, with bad backs and extension rotation syndrome. Like, ah, oh, what went wrong? So. Um, I think we're finally starting to catch on that we need to get stability instead of mobility. But um, yeah, as a whole, I mean, this entire like rotator cuff um, slash scap stability little circuit right here um, could really mutilate shoulder health if you do it wrong. So it's important to you know, do things correctly. To our credit, we did write up exercise descriptions for these. So hopefully that people actually pay attention and aren't jacked up folks all over the country waiting to sue us. So um, day three, take it away, Mike. What do you guys? Uh, we did actually throw in a split squat DQI here. Um, a walking lunge might be require too much stability for someone at this point. What would you swap it out with? Probably a static split squat. Either or. Point. Just so they have better control through their pelvis, yeah. you know, a static squat. Or we went through the reverse lunge today, either one. Static today, exactly. Just a more basic version. I mean, that's a pretty aggressive exercise for somebody that might not be able to perform yeah. it correctly. Talked about stepping back is always going to be easier on the knees than stepping forward. So whether it's, you know, stationary or uh, moving around a little bit. Okay, question? Well, I was going to say, like, day one and three, what would be better off rolling the IT band and trying to stretch it? There you go. Another great go. Remember, soft tissue work for the IT band, you know? I mean, we need to fix whatever the problem is up top and figure out what's going on. But, yeah, soft tissue methods are the way to go with the IT band. I mean, you can stretch it and stretch it, but... I just don't see as good a results as when you get some good soft tissue work. Anything, you know, you, external rotation tends to be the best way to get at it, um, you know, in my experience, because there aren't, there aren't really a ton of internally ro ways to internally rotate the femur. So if you get into a, like a full external rotation stretch, you can usually get at that IT band. But, um, you know, generally speaking, you're working a lot more on the TFL, and, you know, the soft tissue works, so it's going to get on that fascia a lot more. Otherwise, you're just working through the TFL, and it's kind of a so mixed. One of the, one of the you talked about push-up. Mm -hmm. Where you elevate your, you know, those blocks out there, and we have them already. Mm -hmm. 
just elevate your shoulder in there and, and drive, you push it to the floor to maximally contract your TFL or something, and then let, mm -hmm. it, let your hip fall towards the ground, maybe something. Mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, I mean, another, another classic stretch for the TFL is uh, they'll actually have people elevate one foot on a book, uh -huh. and what that automatically does is it pushes one side into ad, um, adduction. So again, you put the abductors on length, you tighten up your glute, and it automatically puts a, a lot of pull on that, that TFL on the IT band. So that's an old stretch that's been around in Kendall for a while, but um, well, certainly one that's... Um, what it'll do is it'll yeah, actually get you set, book here. set a, a book on the floor, um, just elevate yourself about an inch, and on that one downside, what you're going to do is actually just tighten up the glute on this side. So by elevating one leg, you actually slip this hip into adduction. So we know we go into adduction, we're going to put the abductors on a maximal okay. length. And what we do is we tighten up the glute. And what that does is it has a little bit of a pull on the IT band. So this is a very, very subtle stretch. You're not going to expect a lot from it. Um, you know, a classic IT band stretch, you fix somebody against the wall, you kind of right. put the knee behind and try to get into full adduction. But it's not a, an easy thing to get a lot of range of motion in adduction, so you can't stretch it that way. So as a whole, I think that the stretches that we do to, to try to get it into external rotation are, are probably our best bets. But like Mike said, if we want to get on the IT band, you got to get in on the fascia. It's soft tissue work. Sure. Justin, I was saying that you're starting with the heel elevated front squats. Um, I mean, the elevated heel is for tight calves and tight hip mm -hmm. flexors. So maybe it would be better to start with the calf stretch. There you go. See, my, my feeling right now is uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll check them barefooted, or not barefooted, but you know, in their regular shoes. Can, can they squat and get it? If they can't, you know, maybe we'll elevate their heels just to see if is it a calf issue or is it a hip flexor issue. If we find it's a calf issue, I'll, I'll often let them squat with the heels elevated. It won't go above like a five pound plate for about a week or two. Beyond that, if they haven't fixed their calf flexibility, then they're not really serious about training. So um, they have two weeks, in my opinion, to get their calf flexibility around. You know, and most people will actually come around within a few minutes if they do you know, the proper mobilizations. Even some soft tissue work can really clear things up in a, in a short amount of time. So that shouldn't be something that they need to become um, dependent on. It shouldn't become a crutch. Sure. Do you uh, take a pull down there and put the reverse crunch in there? You got it. Exactly. Training PDAs. Stability versus movement. Yeah. You got it. Um, again, there's more of a dynamic movement, um, and this is a little bit more of a static hold, so we use that as a little more of a finisher. Um, that's how we talked about it. There are some guys that will use it as their sole training method, but generally speaking, if you do more of an endurance thing like that, you probably don't want to throw it in before you do dynamic stuff. But like Joe said, probably might not even have been the best idea to do a lot of walking lunges. This is actually relatively, you know, if you have someone who's doing things wrong, this actually turns out to be a relatively quad dominant workout. Eccentric quasi isometric. So, like the push up holds and the split squat holds, it starts out as an isometric. As you fatigue, you start to slip into eccentric action. So, it's kind of active muscle lengthening. It's more of an active stretch. Would I save it for the end? Um, yeah, it, exactly. We, went through, we did some pull throughs, and that, that was really about the end of lower body stuff. So, again, um, I guess. In, in, in retrospect, yeah, you're right. Pull throughs and pull down abs beforehand probably would have been a better way to approach it. Um, probably would have been better to leave pull down abs altogether out. And when we started with the EQIs, I mean, I don't know if we necessarily were using them just for the muscle lengthening effect. We were also using them more for an activation exercise. I don't think we really realized, oh, if we put this at the end, not only are we going to activate the right muscles, but get length back as well. So I think that's something that we probably changed in the last couple of years. But another thing that I would change is the performance of the lunge stretch making it, I think I've talked to a couple people, making it more of an active stretch right from the beginning. We're always talking about people that are anterior tilt, so almost trying to posterior tilt and fire the glute so we get more of an active lengthening of that muscle and regrooving of the proper pelvic position. So it's something really simple that we can add to make it more of a functional or active type stretch. Nice. This is good stuff you guys have been paying attention this weekend. It's encouraging. That's great. What's up? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, Same. fire your glute. Firing that trail leg glute. Yep. Mm -hmm. Fire the glute. Yeah. Yep. Because that's exactly. it's really going to get increase the stretch in the hip flexors and the adductors. It really makes a big difference. Day three. Day four actually. All right, what else have we got? We let him bench a little bit. I'm gonna lie. Okay. Couldn't We're take away. We're trying to correct him on the fly, you know, because it, it's for T Mag. We're not gonna. You gotta you know, sell things. Him the foo foo workout of the month and you know nobody's going to do it and then we're going to give them part two you got to try and maintain their strength while fixing them up all along the way so trying to put the best of both worlds together any ideas here again scm sternocleidomastoid just in case you guys weren't familiar 
I can see. When you go to a distance, the decline plus group retention, you know, a lot of people can't even master the regular bench, so would you not want to switch that to more of the um, I'd probably keep it on decline, truthfully, just because you know, people who have messed up shoulders, they're always going to handle declines a lot better. I might even go on to it like a decline dumbbell press, like a neutral grip dumbbell press. Anything you can do to open up that shoulder girdle. Yeah, any kind of, you know, and not only that, but, you know, constant resistance through the entire range of motion. So, again, that was the arm of adducted to 90 degrees. So, a little bit more of stuff that might have been a little bit too advanced for people early on. Some people aren't ready for that. Exactly. You know, keep them in that, in that safer position. Sure, Matt. Uh, I know this really isn't much of an issue with supersetting, but if you're going to use exercise uh, more, uh, you know, you know, you're going to make progress on first and then, you know, you're going to get the scapular contract as the primary. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. For people with some kind of like scapulohumeral dysfunction, a lot of times what you're going to do is you're going to put this stuff up top and it's going to be almost like an activation work. So, hey, now I've got that upward rotation, you know, force couple working the right way and now I can go and do some of the more comprehensive stuff that really depends on it. So any kind of benching, overhead pressing, stuff like that. Would you do more of the unilateral stuff for A2? Uh, unilateral for the upper body? Um, I, I, personally, I, I, I'm a firm believer in having a master, you know, some of the bilateral stuff first because it tends to be easier for him. But yeah, we still integrated some, um, you know, with a single arm low pulley cable. Uh, actually, that's a row, is what it should say. Dumbbell external rotation. So, and one arm um, lower trap weights. Those are all single side. But going back to mm -hmm. the, the sequencing, um, that would also depend on, on the amount of sets and reps. Mm -hmm. Yep. Rotation, yeah. Fry, and then you fry them. Exactly. And then you go in and ask them to decline close to a branch and support T-Y rows. Yeah. You're actually yeah. Them in a yeah. Position. You don't want to kill out the, all the stabilizers before you actually get Maybe to the meat and potatoes. Set, right? Yeah. One set. Ten reps and then bang. Into those Just like it would be any other mobility or any yeah. kind of activation set. That's a good right, point. That's the distinction you have to make between activation and fatigue. You know, mm -hmm. you want to activate it, but you don't want to fatigue it, mm -hmm. putting yourself at risk. Anybody else missing the really big one at the end? Uh, it's an overhead side bend. So basically, so not only are we making it too difficult in the first place, we're also doing it with like a full range of motion. A long lever type side bend. They, I, yeah, it's, so it's a whim only harder. Yeah, you can't do it with these kettlebells probably. I mean, you start with like five pound dumbbells and you're hurting for like three days. Exactly. People <laughs> like that. There you go. So in that regard, there, there were probably two or three people that did this program that actually had enough shoulder mobility to reach overhead. So, so instead of keep uh, stretching the pecs in the program, it seemed like there was a lot of uh, lat stretching. Exactly. Uh, so, to yeah, so we, we, we talked about, you know, you're going to need to assess the lats, but more often than not, that's going to be an issue. So, um, yeah, I mean, there were lat sessions included in the, uh, the off day programming, but the pecs were always kind of just thrown in the, in the training sessions. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the stuff we did on the off days. That's a, that's a good point, though. You're right. It, it is just as important. And there was a, there was a whole set stretching program that was outlined in it. And truthfully, we've probably gone back and changed the way we recommend doing a lot of those. Um, more emphasis on neutral spine stuff. So again, this is the off day programming that we had talked about a little bit more. Um, we're at that at that point, we were still pretty savvy to like the 23 run rule and making sure that people were doing stuff outside of the gym to do things correctly. And I think that was probably a lot of the reason for the success of the program, in spite of the fact that our programming itself probably wasn't one of the you know, greatest things to write home about, so. Sure. Oh, it doesn't say it, but just the sequential days, day one, day two, but Monday, Tuesday. Oh, they're not, they're not consecutive days, no. Oh, okay. Yeah, so again, we're talking purely from an exercise selection standpoint. We didn't really uh, list Q programming, va programming variables because we knew we could go on all day about that. But. No, no, what I meant mm -hmm. is you says, says day one, day two, day three. No, it was like a Monday, Tuesday, oh, Thursday, oh. Saturday, I think is how it's set up. But it's a good point too. They needed to spread things out a little bit more. But frequency was something that was that was really encouraged. I mean, this is stuff that they were doing whenever they weren't in the gym. We wanted this on a, on a daily basis at home to kind of groove movement patterns. And, I, and again, like I said, I think this is something that made the program as successful as it was, in spite of the fact that we did have some stupid stuff in there that we wouldn't do three years later. Sure, Dan. Uh, on the foam roller. Yeah. You know, I probably would. I, I think it has some value because again, we're still maintaining neutral spine. We're teaching posterior pelvic tilt without really hardcore training the abs and depressing uh, the rib cage. At the same time, we're actually integrating some, some lower limb motion. So I think it still has a lot of merit, believe it or not. I'm not sure I'd do it on the foam roller, but uh, 
you know, that, that's, that seems kind of overkill. And that was the theory behind that was a half foam roller, so okay. slightly elevated, not that high up. But yeah, I'd, I'd probably throw that in still, probably more likely on, on, on flat ground though. Anybody else? This was the one we talked about a little bit out there on, on the fly. How we did them was a little bit different. Probably wouldn't do it on the floor. Instead, we bring people up to a bench so there isn't as much tendency for lumbar hyperextension. And they're more likely to just you know, kind of keep the, the lumbar spine neutral, tighten up the glutes, and just get the thumbs up in the right position. Sure. Anybody else? OK, and again, there were, there were applicable stretches um, that we talked about during the training program, but there was also some, uh, some supplementary ones that we gave as part of the off-day programming. And the big areas we saw with that was we were recommending a lot of stuff um, you know, and not really paying attention to was the spine maintained in neutral while they were doing those stretches. So there's no reason for you to have to round over when you're you know, stretching your doctors or stretching your hamstrings. You can do it just fine without it. Um, sure. So would you execute this, obviously, the way it's said? Yeah, these are mostly like higher reps, hold for times, things like that. So these were on a daily basis, like, you know, like two sets of 20 chin tucks, and you know, we do and TheraBand. Then done with that, then move to yeah, here. we just roll right through. And a lot of stuff, um, you know, we had some unilateral stuff in there too, so you could just kind of bounce back and forth from side to side. But, um, you know, same with side bridges and uh, stuff like that. So it was more important, like we didn't say go and do these all at once. We said just make sure you get this in over the course of the day. Yeah. Try to keep them relatively active. And, yeah, exactly. If they're, if they're at work, we can get up from the table and have them do some prone cobras on the floor. By all means, that's a, that's a great thing. If nothing else, they're trying to improve the motor control aspect of it. Instead of just having them do this stuff like two days a week, right. now they're doing it three, four, five days a week, trying to get those muscles working the way we want them to. So.